Gouverneur Morris, for those who don't know, is one of the great citizens of the United States of America. We've been doing this uh, lecture series, this annual lecture series, where we go around to different areas in the city, mostly at colleges. We're very proud uh, this evening to be with Professor Mark Nason, Al Fordham. That's why we're here. By the way, who gave us the food? We have to announce that. This is from Three Way on Webster Avenue and 187th Street. Thank you. Well, and Dr. Mark Chapman, Chair of African American Studies, graciously applied some of his budget. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, Gouverneur Morris was the penman of the Constitution. It was his hand that you see when you read the Constitution of the United States. He's buried in uh, St. Anne's Church in the South Bronx, along with his half-brother, uh, Louis Morris, who is the signer of the Declaration of Independence. The Morris family have a long tradition in this country, and we claim it at Bronx. So it's only appropriate that we do this. This project that we're involved with, that, you're, that you've been involved with by coming here today, is called the Bronx African American History Project. And it's a collaboration between the Bronx County Historical Society, which I'm the executive director, and the Fordham at the Department of African American American Studies. It aims to explore the history of one of the largest, as it turns out, least studied populations of people of African descent in the United States. There are over a half a million people of African descent in the Bronx making it the eighth largest concentration of urban African Americans in America. Yet there are no scholarly works, which is hard to believe. But we're going to solve that one. We're going to be looking at population patterns of settlement, political behavior, um, labor market participation, cultural and religious life. We're talking about union participation, uh, health and hospitals. It's a very large project, and we're very hopeful. This is one of the first events that we're having this lecture that we're winning today. Uh, it is also, it is also, uh, it, it is also uh, going to be followed up with, uh, our, in our journal, the Bronx County Historical Society Journal, we're going to have an article that's going to be uh, uh, featuring uh, the Patterson Houses, a, a uh, uh, what should we call it, a, uh, a memoir, an interview memoir of someone who grew up in the Patterson Houses in the 1950s. Very interesting stuff. The goal of the project is to produce a series of books, articles, radio shows, documentaries. We'll see how this goes. We're going to have an oral history uh, collection open to the public with films, radio broadcasts, and traveling exhibits capable of reaching school groups and community organizations inside and outside of the Browns and New York City. Without any further uh, discussion, let me introduce tonight's speaker, Professor Mark Nason. start with music, as people who've had me in class will not be surprised to hear. I want to introduce a few people in the audience uh, who uh, make this a very special night. First of all, the Dean of Fordham College, Father Jeffrey Van Arks, who has been a tremendous supporter of African American studies and urban studies and uh, Fordham's connection to the Bronx. He even went to our annual picnic in Cortona Park. <laughs> The first dean in history ever to do that. I also uh, want to introduce my father-in-law, Harry Phillips, who is a member of the New York State Board of Regents. So if any of you have anything you want to say about education that you think that they need to hear in Albany, grab him before he gets more food. Uh, there are also a number of uh, students and colleagues here, uh, and, uh, I'm, and as well as people from the Bronx, so it's a wonderful chance to share some of what I've been doing in the last six months in terms of researching the African-American uh, experience in the Bronx. Now, I want to start off by playing for you two pieces of music that come from the same neighborhood 25 years apart. This is the first piece. It's a song by the Chantals called Maybe. I won't sing it, um, but uh, some of you may remember this. And <laughs> no, I've got to stop. <laughs> 1957.
under the age of 30, this might not seem the epitome of inner city music. But in 1957, this is as inner city as it got. This group came from St. Anthony of Padua's Parish and 165th Street and Prospect Avenue in the Morrisania section of the Bronx. And now, this is the year is 1982. And uh, some of you who are under 30, in fact, all of you, I, I would venture to say, know this. But it's important enough that in the, in the, the lyrics are in the Norton Anthology of African American Literature, which is where I copy them from. the message dramatize an extraordinary shift in the culture, dreams, and lived experience of African Americans in the South Bronx between the mid-1950s and the early 1980s. These songs, so different in tone, content, and feeling, were produced by artists who lived less than six blocks away from one another in the Morrisania section of the Bronx. And this this map uh, is, is meant to illustrate that. The Chantals, the most successful doo-wop group ever to come out of the Bronx, grew up singing together in the choir at St. Anthony of Padua Elementary School, located on 165th Street and Prospect Avenue, which, by the way, is still there. Their song, Maybe, appeared in 1957 a time when many African Americans in the Bronx were having a modest taste of post-war prosperity and were optimistic about their futures. Throughout the neighborhoods in the South Bronx they inhabited, new housing developments were going up at breakneck speed, allowing thousands of black and Latino families to move into clean, airy apartments with ample heat and hot water which were a step up from the tenements many of them lived in when they first came to New York. And in the course of this speech, many of you may be forced to revise your picture of what public housing is and can be. They lived in neighborhoods where most families were intact, where children received strong adult guidance in their home, their block, and their school, 
and where adolescent violence was rarely life-threatening. Grandmaster Flash, one of the three pioneering Bronx DJs credited with founding hip-hop, also grew up in Morrisania at 947 Fox Street, right off 163rd Street, but it was a very different Morrisania than the one the Chantals grew up in. When Mel Mel, the MC for the group, sang, broken glass everywhere, people pissing in the street, you know they just don't care, to a pounding rhythmic backdrop, he was talking about a community buffeted by arson, building abandonment, drugs, gang violence, shattered families, the withdrawal of public services, and the erosion of legal job opportunities. Surrounded by tenement districts that had been ravaged by fires, housing projects that were once centers of pride and optimism had become dangerous and forbidding. Rats on the front porch, roaches in the back, junkies in the alley with a baseball bat, sang Mel Mel. This was the world in which hip-hop was created, a world where government was distant and remote, families were under stress, Adult authority was weak, and young people had to find economic opportunity and creative outlets on their own in the most forbidding of circumstances. How did this happen? How did the harmonic, optimistic environment evoked by the Chantals, the Chords, or Little Anthony and the Imperials give way to the violent, danger-filled world described in clinical detail by the Furious Five, and several years later by another brilliant South Bronx hip-hop lyricist, KRS-One. And how did people respond to these community-destroying forces? Did they give in, leave, try to resist? And if they did resist, how effective was their resistance? These are some of the issues that I will try to address in this evening's talk. Please keep in mind that what I am sharing with you is the product of preliminary research rather than a polished product. Six months ago, the Bronx Historical Society and the Department of African and African American Studies at Fordham came together to launch the Bronx African American History Project, an effort to document the experience of the more than 500,000 people of African descent who live in the Bronx. I decided to focus on the generation of African Americans who moved to the South Bronx from Harlem, the American South, and the Caribbean during and after World War II, the generation of people Colin Powell has written about movingly in the early chapters of his autobiography, An American Journey. I began interviewing members of that pioneering generation, and in the process came across a remarkable group of people who grew up in the Patterson Houses, a 17-building development founded by Morris and 3rd Avenues and 139th and 144th Streets, very near the hub, which is the major commercial district in the South Bronx. These individuals who come together every July for a Patterson Houses reunion are successful professionals in education, business, and the arts who remember the Patterson Houses as a safe, nurturing place from the time it opened in 1950 until heroin struck in the early 60s. Their story, which challenges so much of what people think about public housing, the South Bronx, and black and Latino neighborhoods, is one that I am going to share with you tonight, not only because of its intrinsic value, but because it helps us understand the events that follows. Based on interviews and long discussions with Victoria Archibald Good, Nathan Bubba Dukes, Adrian Best, Arnold Melrose, and Saeed Dupree, I am going to bring back a time when public housing was a symbol of hope, not failure, and when working class black and Latino families supported by strong, well-funded government services helped each other raise their children with love, discipline, respect, and a determination to achieve success in school, athletics, and the arts. And though this story is about Patterson, 
the atmosphere it evokes also existed in the Melrose, St. Mary's, and Forest Houses, the other large developments that opened in the South Bronx in the late 1940s and early 50s. One of the first things that grabbed my attention when I began doing interviews was that African American families who moved into the Patterson Houses saw their arrival there as a step up from the crowded tenement neighborhoods where they had been living. Vicki Archibald Good, whose parents moved to Patterson Houses from Harlem, recalled, there wasn't a lot of affordable housing. I am not sure how long my parents were on the waiting list for public housing, but I do remember my mother saying they were living in one room in my grandmother's apartment before we moved. By the time we moved from Harlem to the Bronx, I was born, my brother Tiny was born, and my mother was pregnant with a third child. By the way, her brother Tiny is Tiny Archibald, one of the 50 greatest players um, in, in NBA history and a 16-time NBA All-Star. Nathan Dukes, whose family moved from a crowded building in the Morrisania section of the Bronx where his father was superintendent, recalled, it was basically like a migration where people moved from the Tinton Avenue, Prospect Avenue area over into the Patterson houses. The projects were relatively new and they were accommodating. The new residents, Dukes claimed, took tremendous pride in their surroundings. Outsiders could not come into the Patterson projects if we didn't know them, he remembered. A lot of the older guys would question anybody who didn't look right who came into the projects late in the evenings. They were basically patrolling. They would walk around the neighborhood making sure things were okay. When the project first opened, children who lived in Patterson experienced a level of communal supervision that is difficult to imagine today. The families who lived in the development, 90% of whom were black and Latino, took responsibility for raising one another's children. Not only did they help one another with babysitting and childcare, they carefully monitored the behavior of young people in hallways from apartment windows and project benches, making public spaces of the huge development anything but anonymous. You couldn't get away with anything, Nathan Dukes recalled. <laughs> the moms and pops, they'd be out in the benches. If you went in the wrong direction, by the time you came back, everybody in the neighborhood would know. And that was it. You'd get a whooping. Vicki Archibald Good, fond, who fondly recalled the camaraderie and supportiveness and nurturing she got from people who were in her building who weren't Blood relatives also remembered that people were quick to correct one another's children. They did not hesitate to speak to you about dropping garbage in the hallway or talking too loud or skating in the hallway. All a neighbor had to say was, don't let me tell your mother. And that's all it took for us to come back to reality. Even childless people got in the act. Vic Vicky remembered a quote, Miss Charlie May, who used to stand in that hallway, sit by the window or on the bench, and everybody knew what was going on in her building, 414 Morris Avenue. This communal investment in child rearing was reinforced by publicly funded programs that provided children in the Patterson houses with an extraordinary array of cultural and recreation op opportunities, which today are normally only available to children growing up in the suburbs. As Josh Freeman points out in his landmark book, Working Class New York, residents of communities like the Patterson Houses were the beneficiaries of a remarkable campaign by the city's post-war labor movement to have government invest in education, health care, recreation, and youth services for working class families. Children growing up in Patterson in the 1950s had round-the-clock supervised activities in a community center housed in the local elementary school, PS18, had first-rate music instruction from teachers at the local junior high school, went on summer field trips to zoos and museums, and got free medical exams, vaccination, and dental care in schools and in clinics. The experience made children in the projects feel at home 
in all of the city's major cultural sites. We had a vacation day camp every summer for children in the projects, Victor Vicki Archibald Good recalled. We went to every single museum you could think of, to Coney Island, to baseball games, to the planetarium. We went to the Bronx Zoo, Prospect Park, the Botanical Gardens. I don't think there was one spot in the city we didn't cover. These programs were headed by teachers and youth workers who te kept, took a deep interest in the welfare of Patterson's children and were in regular communication with parents, reinforcing the communal investment in the neighborhood's young people. Nathan Dukes and Adrian Best both speak, spoke with reverence of the instruction and guidance they received from Mr. Eddie Bonamere, the music teacher at Clark Junior High School in the Patterson Houses, who headed the school's band. At that time, Clark, like most New York City public schools, allowed students to take home musical instruments over the weekend. And Bonamere, a talented jazz pianist, used this opportunity to train hundreds of youngsters from the Patterson Houses to play trumpet, trombone, flute, and violin. Bonamere's extraordinary influence on his pupils, Nathan Dukes referred to him as, quote, the love of my life, was reinforced by his determination to expand the cultural horizons of everyone living in the neighborhood. At the end of every summer, Dukes recalled, Bonamir would sponsor a jazz concert in the schoolyard of PS18 that included famous musicians like Willie Bobo. And according to Dukes, everyone, I mean the entire projects, would be there. Supervised sports program in the Patterson Houses were, if anything, even more visible and influential. The community center at PS18, which was directed by the former CCNY basketball star Floyd Lane, and ex-New York Knickerbocker Center Ray Felix was kept open on weekends, holidays, and weekday afternoons and evenings. Not only did children have a chance to play knock hockey and checkers, do double dutch and play in organized basketball leagues, they had an opportunity to watch some of the greatest African-American <laughs> basketball players in the nation play in the holiday basketball tournaments that Lane sponsored in the local elementary school. Players like Will Chamberlain, Meadowlock Lemon, Tom Thacker, and Happy Hairston showed up regularly on the PS18 court. Similar programs existed in other South Bronx neighborhoods. Nat Jukes, a Dukes joined the community basketball league headed by Hilton White at a public park near Prospect Avenue and played on a softball team called the Patterson Knights that was coached by a burned security guard who lived in the Patterson houses. Because of this array of sports programs, many young people who grew up in Patterson had successful careers in high school, college, and professional athletics, and one of them, Tiny Archibald, became one of the greatest point guards ever to play in the NBA. This portrait of a time when black and Latino children in the Patterson houses experienced strong adult leadership in every dimension of their lives, so challenges the standard portrait of life in public housing that you might find it hard to believe. Wasn't the South Bronx in the 50s the home of numerous street gangs, you ask? Wasn't its neighborhoods filled with illegal activities and a strong underground economy? The answer to both questions is yes. Most of the people who lived in Patterson were poor and gang fighting in the underground economy was part of their lives. But except in rare cases, neither gangs nor illegal activities led to deadly violence. Boys in the Patterson houses were constantly fighting kids from other neighborhoods and other projects, but most of the fighting was done with fists, and adults in the project would step in if knives or zip guns became involved. The underground economy was huge, it was, but its primary manifestation was the numbers, and the major numbers entrepreneur in Patterson, Mr. Clay, carried himself more like a community banker than a thug. A major donor in the church and a sponsor of the community softball team, Mr. Clay dressed formally, did his entire business in his head, and never worried about being robbed by his customers, even though he always carried hundreds of dollars in his pocket. Even those who acted outside the law seemed to operate within a powerful communal consensus. This remarkable period in the life of the Patterson Houses 
which lasted less than 15 years, rested on a number of intersecting factors which would not exist in public housing in New York from the mid-60s on. First was the presence of intact families. All of the families with children who moved into the Patterson houses in the early 50s had two parents present. Secondly, the ready availability of jobs in the local economy that men with high school educations and less could work at. Many of the Patterson, men in the Patterson houses worked in factories and small shops located in the South Bronx. Nathan Duke's father was a furniture assembler. Other men worked in milk, milk bottling plants or small metal shops. Third, schools and community centers near the Patterson houses offered an impressive array of day camps, after school centers, and sports and music and arts programs that offered round the clock supervision and activity for young people. And fourth, and most importantly, most Patterson residents had a sense, reinforced by public policy and lived experience, that life was getting better, that people heading families were living better than their parents had, and that their children were going to do even better than they were. But in the 1960s, the comfort and security of people living in the Patterson houses was to be cruelly shattered by a number of forces, creating an environment ruled by fear and mistrust in which children were too often forced to raise themselves. What changed? When people in Patterson tried to explain why the environment that nurtured them fell apart, the two things they mentioned are heroin and the fragmentation of families. For both Vicki Archibald and Nathan Dukes, it was heroin use which reached epidemic proportions in the early and mid-1960s that did the most to erode bonds of community and trust in the Patterson houses. All of a sudden, young men who were bright, popular, and ambitious were transformed into dangerous and disoriented individuals who wouldn't hesitate to rob their neighbors or families to get their next fix. Vicki Archibald Good, whose best friend's brother was the first person she knew to get hooked, saw heroin strike with the force of, quote, a major epidemic. For the first time, she recalled, I was starting to feel fear, not only for myself, but for the whole community. It was so completely different that I felt I was living in a dream. All of a sudden, everyone in the projects is talking about break-ins saying these were inside jobs, that somebody was letting these folks in to burglarize people's apartments. Then I started hearing about folks that I grew up with getting thrown off rooftops because they were dealing. Nathan Dukes remembered heroin hitting with the force of a flood. It was just an abundance. It came out of nowhere. People you thought would not become involved in narcotics became involved in a very he heavy level. Dukes recalls being devastated during his first year in college by the news that one of his best friends had just gotten shot and killed while robbing a jewelry store. By 1965 and 66, Archibald Good recalled, she didn't feel safe walking back from the subway by herself at night. The Patterson dream had become a nightmare. Here I was in this huge housing complex, and there was a story every day about somebody who OD'd who was, or who was thrown off a roof. So yes, it was a trouble some time for most of us. The impact of heroin on the Patterson community was so traumatic that Nathan Dukes remained, con, remains convinced it was part of a government conspiracy. But there were other forces eroding the community in the mid-1960s that it would also have a lasting impact on the projects in the neighborhood. The fragmentation of families also contributed to uh, the atmosphere of disorder. During the early and middle 60s, Dukes recalled, more and more fathers had begun to desert their families, frustrated by their inability to support their wives and children at a time when the factory jobs they worked at were beginning to leave the Bronx. During those same years, housing projects began to relax their admission standards and open their doors to families on welfare many of them recent migrants from Puerto Rico or the South, or refugees from urban renewal projects in the rest of the city. As a result of both of these developments, the adult male presence in the projects, which had helped keep gang behavior and teenage violence under control, 
began to diminish sharply, leaving public space in control of drug dealers, junkies, and teenage gangs. The resulting violence and chaos led to a gradual exodus of those families that had managed to resist these corrosive forces, most of the West and North Bronx. As a result, sections of the Bronx, which had once been primarily Jewish, Irish, and Italian, such as Morris Heights, University House, South Fordham, and Williams Bridge, began to experience a rapid increase in their black population, while the housing projects of the Bronx increasingly became places for those too poor or troubled to escape to safer areas. The exodus increased further with the wave of arson and disinvestment that spread through Melrose, Mott Haven, and Morrisania in the, later 19, in the early 1970s, and later spread into Highbridge, Morris, Heights, and Cretona, exacerbated by a city fiscal crisis that produced dramatic cuts in public services. By the late 1970s, when the Bronx had become an international symbol of social decay, it would have been impossible for most people to imagine that housing projects in the South Bronx were once safe and nurturing places where children were watched over in every portion of their lives and exposed to the best cultural opportunities the city had to offer. In this moment of decay and despair, an extraordinary cultural movement would arise among young people in the South Bronx, West, and East Bronx whose creative impulses were integrally linked to the atmosphere of social breakdown that surrounded them. That movement was hip-hop and its unique styles of dancing, visual arts, and mu musical expression were created in the Bronx in the face of skepticism, indifference, and occasionally hostility from adults inside and outside the communities that arose. In fact, a good argument could be made that it was the very breakdown of social order and adult authority that made this form of artistic innovation possible, especially in the formative years when hip-hop had no commercial viability. The music writer Nelson George offered the following ironic observation on how the music fit the times. The New York that spawned hip-hop spit me out too. I came of age in the 70s, but I'd be lying if I told you that the 70s were a time of triumph. It was, at times, a frightful experience to walk the streets, ride the subways, or contemplate the future. But in chaos, there is often opportunity, in pain, a measure of pleasure, and joy is just a stroke or two away from pain. The aesthetic industry now known as hip-hop is a product of those blighted times, a child that walked, talked, and partied amidst negativity. Hip-hop developed at a time when the adult presence in the lives of young people in the Bronx had radically diminished. Not only had informal supervision by families, members, and neighbors become far less significant, but music instruction had disappeared from the public schools. I can't emphasize how important that is. When I grew up in Brooklyn, when uh, Nathan Dukes grew up in the Patterson houses, if you were in the band, you could take your saxophone or your trumpet home for the weekend. Schools gave out musical instruments to their pupils. Everybody I knew played an instrument. In Patterson, every one of the men that I knew grew up playing a musical instrument. They sang doo-wop and they played instruments. They still play. That was gone. Music was dis programs were taken out of the public schools in the fiscal crisis in the 1970s. In addition, parks and recreation staffings were cut in half. Hilton White, the person who mentored Bubba Dukes in basketball, he was a parks worker in a New York City public park. Every Playground had recreation supervisors. Those were gone after the fiscal crisis. Afternoon and evening programs in the schools were eliminated. Again, PS 9, uh, 18 in Patterson, like PS 91 in Crown Heights, every afternoon after school, there was afternoon and night center. Gone uh, in the mid-70s. And sports programs 
with the exception of a few elite programs like the Gauchos basketball program, were cut to the bone. No more Little League in the South Bronx. No more softball. It was bare bones and only for the elite athletes. More and more, in this environment, young people had to bring up themselves. And the results was that gangs in the Bronx became far larger and violent than their 50s counterparts. Rates of violent crime quadrupled since the 50s, and the underground economy had come to replace the legal economy as a source of employment for youth and hopes of achieving uh, any kind of income. Along with gang activity also came radical politics. In the late 60s and early 70s, more intellectually inclined Bronx youngsters were gravitating to the Black Panther Party and the Young Lords, the Nation of Islam and the Five Percenters, and community action groups seeking, were also seeking to wrest political control of the Bronx from uh, its Irish, Jewish, and Italian leadership. So, along with the gangs, drugs, and disinvestment, a race-conscious political activism was also part of a, a chemistry that created hip-hop as a cultural movement. The birth of hip-hop as a distinctive musical form can be traced back to the year 1973. And this is agreed on by almost all hip-hop pioneers, that a Jamaican immigrant named Cool DJ Herc began holding parties at the community center of his building, 1520 Sedgwick Avenue, not all that far from Fordham. And that's in the Morris Heights section of the Bronx. At that time, 1973, you couldn't hold a, a public party in the Bronx without being concerned which of the gangs would show up and how they would respond, particularly the two most feared of the gangs, the Savage Skulls, which were predominantly Latino, and the Black Spades, which were predominantly black. Competition for territory and prestige by gangs, and there were many more than these two, dominated public space in many parts of the Bronx, with neither a fiscal crisis decimated police force nor local adults able to control their activity. In addition to fighting, though, competition began between these gangs was also beginning to take the form of graffiti writing and dancing, with gang members at clubs trying to outdo each other in launching acrobatic moves on the dance floor uh, of the clubs and parties they attended. Now, the innovation that Herc inaugurated was to take music that was no longer played on mass market radio, which was at this point all about disco, um, and take heavily rhythmic music by people like James Brown, Sly and the Family Stone, and George Clinton, and have a sound system which emphasized the bass notes in these funky rhythms, and to use tur two turntables so you could take the most danceable portions of this music and have them played in consecutive order. The result, uh, both of the sound system, the emphasis and bass, and taking the most danceable parts of these records was to create a sound that drove dancers wild and turn the competition on the floor between gangs into high theater. Uh, what soon became known as breakdancing described the increasingly acrobatic moves that took place at Herc's parties at the Sedgwick Community Center, which people all over the West Bronx flocked to see. Soon, Herc began moving his events outdoors by ho ho hooking up his sound system to street lights in schoolyards and public parks so that thousands of people were starting to attend them. He eventually found a commercial venue for his shows at a little place called Club Kivalo on Jerome Avenue between Tremont and Burnside. By 1974, write this down, uh, uh, and 1975, Hertz's style of DJing had started spread through other neighborhoods of the Bronx and connect with traditions of toasting, boasting, and oral dexterity that had long been established in black communities. 
uh, and uh, that was represented in things like the dozens, the rapping of DJs on black radio stations. Um, this, there was a long tradition of verbal dexterity, which was often reflected itself in, in rhyme. And one of the things that Herc began to do with his shows at Club Hevelo was to add variety to his performances and stir up the audience further. Herc began to allow one of his partner DJs named Coke LaRock to grab a microphone and start to throw out poetry. This innovation was so successful that Herc started to gather other MCs to his shows, and they soon began to compete in terms of how well they could stir up the crowd. This, some people say, is where rapping, longer respected art in black communities, became a part of hip-hop. So if those of you want to know what's the difference between rap and hip-hop, hip-hop, in, in, in hip-hop, uh, breakdancing, graffiti art, and DJing all were established before rapping. Rapping was the last of the four elements, though it turned out it was the one that was most commercially marketable. But no one knew this. No one was interested in this. I can assure you that the Department of African American Studies in the mid-70s, when this was going on, less than a mile away in some cases, because one of the major centers was the PAL at 183rd and Webster. That was where some of the most amazing DJ battles were taking place. We didn't have a clue. And if somebody told us, we, didn't, we, we wouldn't have been responsive because we didn't think this was music. And, and I have to be honest, you can interview Dr. Mangum, who was also there at the time, or Dr. Wilkes, who's no longer here. This was very close, and we didn't have a clue. But that was true of most people of our generation. Um, when Herc blew up in the West Bronx, even establishing a major venue right next to Fordham at the PAL Center at 183rd Street and Webster Avenue, a former gang leader from the Bronx River Projects who called himself Africa Bombada began holding parties in the community center of his housing project that built on and in some respects expanded Herc's innovations. Influenced by the Nation of Islam and the Black Panthers, and even by the hippies, Bambada created an organization called the Zulu Nation, aimed at bringing cooperation among Bronx gangs, and used hip-hop culture to attract them to his shows. And I want to read you what uh, Africa Bambada says about his background, because it does show the influence of political activism in some wings of hip-hop. This is African Bambada, and it's from an amazing book, which any of you in hip, interested in hip-hop in the Bronx must get, called Yes, Yes, Y'all, The Oral History of Hip-Hop's First Decay. This is an amazing book. I grew up in the Southeast Bronx. It was an area where back in the late 60s, early 70s, there was, quote, broken glass everywhere, like Mel Mel said in the message. But it was also an area where there was a lot of unity and a lot of social awareness going on at a time when people of color were coming into their own, knowing that they were black people, hearing records like James Brown, say it loud, I'm black and proud, giving us awareness, hearing people like Sly and the Family Stone telling you to stand. You can make it if you try, everyday people. Seeing all the violence that was going on with the Vietnam War and all the people in Attica and Kent State and being aware of what was going on in the late 60s with Woodstock and Flower Power, the love movement, just being a young person and seeing all this happening around me put a lot of consciousness in my mind to get up and do something. It played a strong role in trying to say we've got to stop this violence with the street gangs. So the second of the great DJs had a political vision. Um, and uh, that political vision is still with him because the, it, the Zulu Nation is still an international movement. Um, and Africa Bambada, in fact, uh, spoke at Fordham a year and a half ago uh, as part of the Hip Hop Week we sponsor. One of the things that, uh, that, that Bambada brought to hip hop was his tastes were more eclectic in music uh, than, than DJ Herc. 
he uh, added rock and Latin and jazz to the funk-driven beats he was playing and encouraged break dancers from all over the Bronx to come to his center. He also uses the community center in the house in, in the development he lived in. A lot of Africa Bombada's events were in the community center of the Bronx River houses. And again, that's on the map here, right? Um, it's um, just east of the Bronx River Parkway between the Bronx River and Sheridan Expressways. Um, and um, Bombada also encouraged poets and MCs to work alongside him, creating a more artistically varied product than Herc usually did. The final hip-hop in innovator was Grandmaster Flash, an electronic wizard who figured out ways of having turntables mingle breakbeats automatically by developing complex feedback machines. And as much as I've read what he did, I can't explain it, so, being a, not a, a, a person who's skilled in technology. But he was what people did by hand, he was able to program in advance and do it much faster, hence his nickname, Flash. A grad Flash, a graduate of Samuel Gompers Vocational High School, first began performing in schoolyards in the Morrisania section of the Bronx, especially in the schoolyard of IS-63, which is on a, a, a Boston Road between 169th and 168th Street. So, again, very close to the Chantels. Um, and that neighborhood was more, far more than the West Bronx, was one which had been devastated by fires. The worst fires that had taken place in the Bronx was in the stretch of neighborhood south of Cretona Park, where uh, that's where, uh, you know, Jimmy Carter went, it's where Ronald Reagan went, it was people uh, from all over the world would go to Charlotte Street and look out, and that is very close. This is the same time as Grandmaster Flash was holding forth in, in schoolyards and parks in that neighborhood. And um, he, or he was then uh, picked up by small clubs in the neighborhood and became the dominant figure in hip-hop in the South Bronx neighborhoods of Melrose, Mott Haven, and Hunts Point. In addition to his technical innovations, Flash was famous for attracting a very talented group of poet MCs who would compete against each other in rhyming to uh, push themselves to feats of creativity, which would then stir the crowd. And when people talk about Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five, he was talking, he had five different MCs, the two most famous of which were Cowboy, the first of his MCs, and then, of course, Mel Mel, who is the voice on, you know, you heard on the message. Now, what makes this entire movement remarkable, and I, I think just, let me pass this book around, because it would, uh, it, 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 in some ways, a picture, uh, it, it'll take about six weeks to get around, uh, uh, is worth a thousand words, is that it was created entirely by people under the age of 30 with virtually no support or encouragement from parents, teachers, community centers, directors, or the music industry. In fact, one of the great stories of Grandmaster Flash is of constantly getting beaten up by his father for listening to his records and then beaten up by his mother for using her audio equipment. This was not activity which was encouraged. And uh, there's also an, an, an aesthetic reason, because hip-hop was about rhythm and, uh, and emphasizing a powerful bass line. And rhythm overpowered, if not eliminated, harmony in early hip-hop. And because turntables and records had replaced musical instrument and voice, many people brought up on gospel, blues, jazz, soul, like yours truly, had difficulty regarding it as music, just as many people had difficulty regarding graffiti as art. Uh, but because so many young people had grown up in the fractured world that hip-hop arose in, the audience for it grew to the point that hip-hop became the major form of community entertainment 
among young people in the Bronx and soon spread far beyond its borders. The story of hip hop's growth and development is a testimony to the vitality of the human spirit, the ability to create in the face of tragedy uh, and pain. But it does not give my story a happy ending. Although hip hop has given young people in the Bronx, South Bronx, and communities like it throughout the world, a vehicle and a moral compass that helps them describe the conditions in which they live and has prevented the media and government from rendering them invisible, it has not been able to turn fractured neighborhoods into safe, supportive communities like the ones Vicki Archibald and Nathan Dukes grew up in. To do that, we need more than an unvarnished portrait of Project Life as it's lived now, as you have in the work of Jay-Z or Nas or Wu-Tang. We have to try to recreate the nurturing and inspiration and guidance that children in the Patterson houses once received, not only from their families and their neighbors, but from a government committed to giving working class children the opportunity to rise to the highest level of achievement in business, politics, and the art, and exposing them to cultural opportunities that the wealthiest children in the society uh, also had. Public housing was once a place where dreams of success and achievement were nurtured. There is no way, reason why, if we can find a way to rekindle our passion for justice, it cannot play that role again. Thank you. And uh, one of these students, Victor Gonzalez, virtually adopted about 10 kids in the Arthur Avenue community whose families had fractured and had, you know, were, were, were very anxious to have his help. And he would bring them to my office. And it became clear to me that hip hop was the only thing that described what they were living through. And that there was no other narrative in literature or film or anywhere else that, that spoke to their lives. And so I started listening to this a lot more carefully. And that was the first sign. And then um, I, I, I did a lot of coaching in Brooklyn. Uh, in fact, Mike Corker in, in the back, who's a, a filmmaker who's going to be working with us, was one of my basketball players, uh, along with my son Eric and several kids who grew up in Prospect Heights and Red Hook. and. Um, and hip hop was always on in the car, and it was. A, and one of the things that I found is that kids who had no interest in school were passionately engaged intellectually in this music. I, I you know, and 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 would argue the merits of different lyricists and different traditions. So I began to see that if you were going to communicate with young people, you know, in 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 in, in New York in the 90s. You had to know this, and it just it hit me. It, it hit me through you know through direct personal contact. So that was my uh, venue. Yeah, Mark, to how would you rank the loss of jobs, factory jobs, in the Bronx as the beginning of that decline? Well, you know, I, I mean that's the classic explanation that political scientists, economists give. But when I, I began interviewing people, they, they saw heroin as the thing that changed their world and destroyed their world. And heroin as something that hit the young men. And it, 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 that dissolved the sense of community. Now, you might be able to make the argument that those young men were, you know, were were uh, accessible to this play because they knew the jobs were disappearing. But one of the things I've learned as sort of as a historian is let the research guide me, not what logic. In other words, I, I, think, I think this is, some, this is one of the things we're going to be looking at. This is one of the things we'll be studying, we'll be talking to a lot of people and, 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 and trying to get a sense of sequence. And, 
at this point, again, the people I'm speaking to said it was the drugs, you know, was the foremost thing that, that, that they perceived that was changing this world. Yeah? You said there was a, um, a correlation between um, in the Bronx because of drug addiction and the lack of the nuclear family, correct? Um, two parents. So are you saying that because of what happened to the drugs, uh, men started to not uh, take care of their family as much, or was it that, you know, men stopped, um, just automatically just stopped for some reason okay, uh, wanting to be a part of the family, and then kids were able to, you know, to do things like sell drugs and get involved in drug addiction? Again, remember what I said. I said this is at the very early stages of something that's going to take a number of years. The sense that I'm getting is that men were beginning to leave families in part because their economic prospects were diminishing as their families were growing. And often this was correlated with alcoholism. And this was occurring at approximately the same time that young men were getting involved in heroin. How the two were correlated is something I'm going to have to look into. You know, they, they, since they both occurred at approximately the same time, there may well be a connection with them, but I haven't done enough work to confidently say what that is. Yeah? Would you say that the loss of jobs in, a, in a many ways but due to the fact that manufacturers were looking for cheaper labor elsewhere, going south and going out overseas. Absolutely. I mean, what made the, the what made the Patterson such a, a a a great place was in part what the labor movement you did with its political influence to force government to provide these kind of services in working class communities, and certainly manufacturers left to find cheaper labor. The weak, which did two things. It took jobs away from a community that needed it, but it also took away from the power of the unions to, you know, to provide these kind of social services. I mean, what strikes me is that, like today, you know, you're, you're in, in a neighborhood I grew up in, an upper middle class neighborhood, Park Slope. Kids have music lessons, they have dance lessons, they go on trips, their parents take them to museums. Uh, they, you know, they were, ex this is what kids in the Patterson had. It's, it, it, they had the cultural opportunities of somebody growing up in Scarsdale today. But that was because there was a strong labor movement with a socialist tradition, or at least a social democratic tradition, that believed that working class people deserved the best cultural, recreational, and educational opportunities that a society could provide. You say the government began to cut, because of financial constraints, the services for after-school programs and whatnot. And um, I would gather that, did the government not see the correlation with the increase in crime because of these cuts? And if they did, why didn't they step in and, and see that this was a problem and try to fix it? I'm going to use two phrases from the 70s, benign neglect and planned shrinkage. Benign neglect was a phrase coined by the late Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan when he was a, um, uh, an official in the Nixon administration saying that uh, problems of the minorities and the poor could benefit from a period of benign neglect because the rhetoric had become overheated and the problems, uh, the demands placed on government too great. The phrase planned shrinkage came from a commissioner of housing in New York City named Roger Starr, who said that the South Bronx, in, in a fiscally strained time, when New York City was virtually bankrupt, the city had to make certain choices. And, and so certain neighborhoods had to be sacrificed so that others could thrive. So he argued that firehouses and community programs and schools and police stations should be closed in some sections of the South Bronx so that adjoining neighborhoods could, could be healthier. So, I mean, the, the fiscal situation of New York was so bad in the 70s and the federal government so disinclined to help it that people in government knew what was going on 
and either and 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 didn't feel and felt they had to engage in a form of triage. And certain neighborhoods were seen as in in that situation not worth the investment. I mean, to this day, um, the parks budget is 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 about half of what it was before the fiscal crisis. And if you go around New York City, if you look at Central, any of you like to go to Central Park? Um, beautifully manicured, you know, just, it's, it's extraordinary how gorgeous and well kept it is. And almost all of the funding for that is privately raised through an organization called the Central Park Conservancy. You go up to Inwood Park, at the tip of Manhattan, the northern tip of Manhattan, arguably the most beautiful physical setting in the city. The grass isn't cut, the trees aren't pruned, there are weeds. You, I, I went to a park in uh, the Baychester section across from where Nat Dukes now lives, beautifully designed. Same thing, nobody cuts the grass, nobody cleans up. If you don't, parks are well kept in, in New York now only through private funding. So, um, we have still, in some respects, not recovered from the loss of public services that took place in the fiscal crisis. Now, in the 90s, people did get the idea that, you know, especially in the heyday of the crack epidemic, we better try to invest in youth services. So there are now more youth sports leagues after school centers than, than there were in the 70s, but not nothing like this where the music you know they, they and and as for music you have to fundraise privately for music there's this whole save the music group i mean i took i played saxophone in high school and i was terrible but i didn't have to buy a saxophone erasmus hall high school gave me a saxophone to take home they trusted me every school in the city had that that doesn't exist now you know and um, you know, this PS18 community center, it was open until 10 o'clock every weekday. It was open on weekends. The only days it was closed were in Christmas and Easter. You know, these kids, and this was, this was a low-income housing project. I bet there are other countries which have this in their housing projects. We once did in New York. Have you had a chance to examine the, um, the policies of the New York City Housing Authority and the transition in those policies from the early 50s and in through the mid-60s and late 60s? Because I think you'll find that the imposition of very rigorous admission standards for tenancy in the public housing project um, changed considerably over that period, as did their policies regarding eviction of troublesome and dysfunctional people. Uh, and I'd be interested uh, if you do get or have had the chance to see that, to what extent you think that played a role? Yeah, I think that definitely played a role. Although what's interesting is the people who are, you know, again, this is at very early stages. The people who are describing the transition see the arrival of troubled families as coming after problems had started with the original group. The people who were jumping, being thrown off the roofs were not new families. They were, you know, people in the old families. That's what made it traumatic. Vicky's, you know, Vicky Archibald's neighbor and best friend's brother was the first person she knew to get on drugs. So, I mean, again, this, the sequence is somewhat important and is something I'm, you know, there's no question that in the mid-60s, um, the New York City Housing Authority began to seriously loosen its, uh, its, its admission standards um, and, it, and it, this became the place where fam displaced and troubled families were put, which was not how it originally developed. It was, this is, was for working class, you know, two-parent families with very rigid standards. But the, what I'm getting a sense is the disintegration occurred before that transition, and that transition was not the first cause. A corollary to that is, do you, do you think that the, um, the Patterson Houses and places like it in the, the golden age that you described 
were havens from what was going on in the wider society, or that the wider society was generally um, a much more benign place? I think that the wider society was a more benign place as well. I mean, uh, you know, you read Colin Powell's, you know, biography, and he's describing living on Kelly Street in that time, and, you know, there's fighting, but there's, you know, no one is getting killed. People are looking out for one another. Uh, there's, um, you know, there's some of these community programs were not in the, ho the Patterson houses as such. The, uh, um, and, and also, um, I, I, I think that there was a lot of very poor housing. In, in 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 the Bronx and in Harlem, and, a lot of drug uh, but in the in in the fifties, I well, that's an interesting question. Would somebody who was living on Fox Street in 1953 feel as safe as somebody who was living in the Patterson houses, or somebody living on Kelly Street? I mean, that's also something that you know that 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 definitely needs to be looked into. Probably not, but on the other hand, you know, the, the social services were there in, you know, the schools in that neighborhood were, were doing that. Now, the one thing I want, do want to say is let's look at Dua, which I haven't had a chance to do, which was a product of all of these communities. Not, you know, and Dua was more, the, the public schools actually encouraged the Dua groups. Music teachers in Morris High School helped some of the formative doo-wop artists get, you know, music contracts. Um, you you definitely get the sense that adults in these in in the schools and the community centers were involved with the youth in ways that, you know, was not either possible or uh, was not possible or not happening later, and that was happening whether you lived in a tenement district or a, uh, or a housing project. But again, that's a very good question, and it's something for us as we, you know, if you think of this project as having a 10-year trajectory, this is the first six months. So, and this is the first public talk on it. So, you know, that should be kept in mind. Your questions are, are become my questions. Mark, you had your hand up. Uh, yeah. I, well, first, I wanted to thank you for your uh, for your talk, um, because the passion and energy that you bring to the topic is just contagious. You know, I really appreciate that. And also, uh, in formulating a question, I, I hear that one of the main themes that you're des describing, the context in which hip hop emerges, is really a determination on the part of young people to be the subjects of history. To, to be heard despite all of the uh, all of the dehumanizing conditions that are affecting their lives. So it's really a determination on their part to be seen and, and, and to be heard. And it seems as if you're describing that there were simultaneously uh, a lyrical content in the emerging music that was apolitical and political at one and the same time. Yeah. I guess the, the question that uh, is intriguing me is that as these new art forms were emerging, there, there seems to be an entrepreneurial uh, aspect to these young men that is quite intriguing. It's the first time I've ever really thought about it. That even before the commercial and marketing aspects of hip hop uh, became a prominent factor, that a young person who decided that they were going to use turntables in this inventive way had to not only have the personal self-confidence to, you know, to affirm their own gift, but also some marketing skill as to draw people to them. Oh, man. Is there anything that you, know, that you can speak on? Absolutely. I mean, when, see, sometimes when people talk about old school as though they were completely pure, I think your point is that th th there was an entrepreneurial element. You look at the flyers for these hip hop events. They they were these these uh, you know Herc and Bombada and Flash were geniuses at attracting a following, um, uh, and you know and and they they did derive some income from it. You know uh, especially when not so much in the schoolyard jams. But once they got into small clubs, they were able to charge admission, or sometimes they charged admission at community centers. But 
they were competitive with one another in trying to attract people. And eventually, you know, they had thousands of people who followed them around. So, yeah, I mean, there, there was a promotional element to it. There was a creative element to it. Um, and, uh, it, it. And I think in some ways it's a little bit different than going back to do rock and rock and roll, where the promotion was done by the record companies. That's where, you know, you had built, you know, you had these small record labels that were really into marketing. But you didn't have a record label enter hip hop until 1979 when Sugar Hill Records produces Rapper's Delight. So that's a full six years before a record company gets involved. And if you go into the history of African American music, that's a long period. Because, you know, in, in, the, in the 20s, these record companies, you know, took blues and marketed. You know, even uh, Robert Johnson and Muddy Waters and John Hurt, all these people who were working as tractor drivers, they were making records. You know, they, you know, so there is something that shows you how isolated the South Bronx was, that it took six years before this happened. I also found something fascinating in the book that um, WFUV had one of the hip, early hip hop DJs doing a regular Saturday morning radio show, Eddie Chiba, who performed at the T Connection on Gun Hill Road and White Plains Road. He was one a little bit smoother than the MCs. They were, see, there, there's also something which I didn't talk about, which ultimately rapping came sort of coming together with the street rappers like Mel Mel and Cowboy and Coke LaRock, coming together with people like Eddie Chiba and DJ Hollywood, who were Manhattan Harlem-based people who were sort of smooth talkers, more like the radio DJs. And eventually, the rapping fused the, the, the street authenticity with the smooth. But FUV had a well-known DJ, uh, rapping DJ, doing a radio show in the 70s. So, so there. I wasn't completely crazy. <laughs> Any other questions? Thank you, Professor Mason.